Hello and welcome to the Fusion Payroll Implementation course from ERP Web Tutor. And in this chapter, we're going to continue with our common HCM configurations. And we're going to try to understand the different enterprise components that play a key part in any payroll implementation. So we have these different components, enterprise, legal entity, legal employer, payroll statutory unit, and tax reporting unit. Now the enterprise, as we all know, is a top organization or a representation of the highest level of the company. So that's the company itself. And you can only have one enterprise per implementation for a client. So that is very important. And the next, uh, the four parts, the four components that you are seeing, legal entity, legal employer, payroll statutory unit, and tax reporting unit, there are these components sometimes can be confusing. That's why we will take a deep dive into all of these components and what significance each of it has. So the legal entity is a party with rights and responsibilities given by legislation. It has a government registration number as well. It can be a legal employer and it can be a payroll statutory unit. Now let's see what a legal employer is. A legal employer is basically a legal entity that employ workers, okay? So a legal entity and legal employer, they could be the same object, okay? Now a legal entity, once it's allowed to employ workers, then it becomes a legal employer. A payroll statutory unit, it's also a legal entity that is responsible for paying workers, including the payment of payroll tax and social insurance. So again, as you can see, payroll statutory unit is also a legal entity. So in terms of actual configuration, legal entity is the configuration item and you classify that as a legal employer or a payroll statutory unit or both. So a legal entity can be either a legal employer or a payroll statutory unit or both. The next is the tax reporting unit, which is the government reporting entity that used to be the GRE in EBS. So that is used to group workers for the purpose of tax and social insurance reporting. We will see that in the application. Now, we have come up with this useful scenarios that will help you to understand uh, what kind of architecture that you need to define uh, based on your client's needs. The scenario one is showing you a single legal entity for all employees. Now this is applicable for smaller clients or in certain scenarios where all the employees belong to a single legal entity. Okay, you may come across this scenario. We have come across the scenarios where the client only has one legal entity and that itself is a legal employer and a payroll statutory unit as well as a tax reporting unit, okay? So this is one scenario. So single legal entity for all the employees. And you can see here that in this case, this is the EWT USA is the legal entity that itself is classified as a uh, payroll statutory unit, you have the legislative data group, in this case the US LTG tied at the payroll statutory unit level, and this is classified as a legal employer as well. And then you have the tax reporting unit that is that comes below the legal entity in the hierarchy. The scenario two is you have multiple legal entities in the US and it is not a common paymaster. Now, we will understand this concept of common paymaster uh, when we go into the worked out example that we have. Now, in this example, as you can see here, that the enterprise has uh, two different payroll statutory unit, okay? So one is um, the EWT USA and the other one is Horizon USA. And then you have your legal entity, uh, EWT USA, also a legal employer and also a tax reporting unit and they belong to the US legislative data group and on the other side of the tree you have 
Horizon USA, which is a legal entity, uh, which is classified as a payroll statutory unit. So you can see here, these two legal entities, Horizon USA and EWT USA, they belong to two different payroll statutory unit. So that is the reason we are calling this as not a common paymaster. In the following slide, we're going to see how the architecture looks like when it uh, is a common paymaster. So the same architecture follows on the Horizon side as well. Okay. The scenario three is we have multiple legal entities in the US and it is serving as a common paymaster. You can see here, same here, same way the enterprise is at the top. Then you have your payroll statutory unit or PSU. In this case, EWT USA serves as the PSU. It's connected to the US legislative data group. Then you have the two legal entities, the same way as it was before, EWT USA and Horizon USA. Both are serving as legal employers. That means that employees can either belong to EWT USA or Horizon USA. But they both have the same EWT USA as the payroll statutory unit, which means the legal entity EWT USA serves as a legal employer and a PSU whereas the legal entity Horizon USA is just a legal employer and belongs to the EWT USA PSU, okay? And then the tax reporting units we have, uh, you can have multiple tax reporting units under each legal entity as well, okay? And that is, you have to find out from your client uh, how their, uh, what kind of tax reporting units they have, and then you define that, okay? Now, <coughs> We need to understand the importance of a common paymaster and the difference between a common paymaster and not a common paymaster. Now for that, we are going to go to our Excel sheet and I'm going to show you uh, how the common paymaster versus non-common paymaster works. So let's take a look. Now, this is a worked example, a simple example of EWT Corporation, which is not a common paymaster. Okay? It has two legal entities, LEA and LEB, and let's say both of them serve as um, their own uh, legal employers as well, and then they belong to their own payroll statutory unit. So this is the scenario two that we have seen in our slides. And here's an employee who has made 100,000 in legal entity A and then was moved to legal entity B and made another 100,000 under legal entity B. Now, the social security withholdings, I'm just using this as an example because social security has a limit. You can see here, this annual limit is $118,500. So this is your social security taxable wages, wage, okay? And the social security withholding percentage is 6.2% right now. So in this scenario, when the employee worked in legal entity A and made $100,000, assuming that all of it is social security taxable wage, then the withholdings, 6.2% of 100,000, this is $6,200. Now when the employee moves, to legal entity B and also makes 100,000, the social security continues to go all the way up to uh, 6,200, okay? Now, based on this, 118,500, so this is the social security limit, okay? The wage limit. And we said that it's 6.2%. Okay. Now, annual withholding for the employee based on this, on any individual, okay, should be 6.2% of 118,500, which is $7,347. Okay. And you can clearly see that in this example, when the company is not a common paymaster, the social security withholding is clearly more than what it should be. 
it is $12,400. Okay. Now that is what's going to happen. Of course, the employee is going to get a refund for this difference, but in terms of withholding, uh, payroll is going to continue withholding um, up to 6,200 because it starts from zero. And in this legal entity B or legal employer B, it hasn't reached the limit of $7,347. So that's the reason why it continues to withhold uh, even though the employee uh, is working or making the, a certain amount of money and the withholding continues. So this is what happens when the company is not a common pay master. Okay? So the tax balance does not go over from one legal entity to another legal entity. That's the main difference. And if the tax balance don't go with the employee when they move from one legal entity to another, it's going to start from zero. Okay, now take a look at this scenario where this EWT corporation acts as a common paymaster. And the same scenario, employee makes $100,000 in legal entity A and $100,000 in legal entity B. The social security withholdings in legal entity A is 6,200 as per the 6.2% and then it carries over to legal entity B and the only withholding that's going to happen in legal entity B is the difference between the annual limit, which is 7,347 minus the 6,200, which is 1,147 and then the withholding will stop. So that's the primary difference between a common paymaster and a not not a common paymaster. The same thing will going to apply for Medicare as well, and anything that goes, the balances go. Um, uh, there, there's an annual limit for that. Uh, for 401k and stuff like that also, that has to be uh, handled carefully if the company is not a common paymaster. So we thought that this would be a useful information. So that's all for now. Thanks for watching.